had barely kissed British soil when the briefing about him began. The Chancellor had returned home to be fired. The Prime Minister was about to perform a major U-turn on her mini-budget. But it is clear that parts of our mini-budget went further and faster than markets were expecting. So the way we are delivering our mission right now has to change. We need to act now to reassure the markets of our fiscal discipline. I have therefore decided to keep the increase in corporation tax that was planned by the previous government. This will raise £18 billion per year. But government humiliations like this demand sacrifices to be made, and Kwasi Kwarteng's was the head to roll. I met the former Chancellor earlier today. I was incredibly sorry to lose him. He is a great friend, and he shares my vision to set this country on the path to growth. Today, I have asked Jeremy Hunt to become the new Chancellor. He's one of the most experienced and widely respected government ministers and parliamentarians. He's one of the a new Chancellor after just 39 days as Prime Minister and sacked for tax pledges which she won the Tory leadership race championing. After Liz Truss uh, awkwardly scanned the crowd, searching out just four journalists she had agreed to take questions from, their questions were brief but brutal. Can you explain to the public why you think you should remain as Prime Minister, given you junked a key tax cut that led you to be elected? Will you apologise to your party? Given everything that has happened, what credibility do you have to continue governing? He has to go because of the fallout from it. How come you get to stay? Well, my priority is making sure we deliver the economic stability that our country needs. That's why I had to take the difficult decisions I've taken today. The mission remains the same. We do need to raise our country's economic growth levels. I now call the Chancellor of the Exchequer to make a statement. Chancellor. Yeah. This was just three weeks ago today. The newly installed Chancellor making his fiscal statement billions of pounds of unfunded tax cuts. But I'm not going to cut the additional rate of tax today, Mr Speaker. I'm going to abolish it altogether. And this was the first tax cut to be U-turned on. This is a humiliation, Chancellor. After markets dived and the cost of government borrowing soared, investors across the globe spooked that Britain's finances no longer looked like a safe bet. I know the plan put forward only 10 year, uh, days ago has caused a little turbulence. I get it. I get it. Reversing a tax cut for top earners wasn't enough to calm the markets or save his job, though. I'll be coming up with a statement on the 31st of October and I'm not going to preempt that. That was Mr Kwarteng talking yesterday in Washington at a meeting of the International Monetary Fund, a meeting he was summoned home from early. At lunchtime today, after meeting with Liz Truss, Mr Kwarteng left Downing Street, no longer Chancellor. And then came the letters and mixed messages from the now former Chancellor and his Prime Minister. In his very first line, Mr Kwarteng wrote, You have asked me to stand aside as your Chancellor. I have accepted. While Liz Truss responded, I deeply respect the decision you have taken today. So what do you hope to achieve as the new Chancellor? We'll have lots of chances to go if calming the markets is what Jeremy Hunt hopes to achieve, today has not been a success. The interest rates on 10-year government debt remain stubbornly high, while the pound actually fell slightly against the dollar. Governor Bailey, how do you feel the Prime Minister is doing? I've got another meeting to go to. Andrew Bailey tight-lipped today at the IMF as the Bank of England wound up its support package buying up billions of pounds worth of government bonds. In London, though, economists say a new Chancellor may have bought Liz Truss some breathing space, but they're still on ease. Probably we will still see some jitters. It's quite likely that the market will hold and give the new Chancellor the chance to come up with a revised plan and will give the new Chancellor a little bit of a breathing space. Labour say a change of government is needed. It's not just time for another Conservative Chancellor. It's time for a Labour government because only Labour have the plans to grow our economy and provide the economic stability that our country desperately needs. 
you're meant to be the party of fiscal responsibility. Less than 40 days, we've got this huge screeching U-turn. Is your credibility shot? It's not in a good place. I mean, it'd be very hard to argue that uh, what has happened over the last few weeks has done anything other than to put a huge amount of pressure on uh, the Conservative Party's long fought for, long hard won um, reputation for fiscal prudence. I think she won't last out next week, let alone Christmas. So her speech today was frankly, I mean, I have no words to describe what she was saying in uh, Downing Street earlier on. It was awful. Liz Truss's press conference today lasted just eight minutes and 54 seconds. Thank you very much, everybody. Prime Minister, you're out of your depth, aren't you, Prime Minister? You're out of your depth. Shock, not just in the room, but a reaction reflected in the markets and among her own MPs, many of whom think 39 days of Liz Truss is enough. And Paul is with me now. Now, we're going to talk about the scepticism in the markets in a, in a couple of minutes, but Liz Truss had to persuade her own MPs and her own party. Has she gone anywhere towards doing the trick? No. In short, I mean, you were in that room. I think we all heard how shocked you were. And literally, as you were standing up after that press conference, I was getting text messages from Tory MPs saying they thought that press conference had made matters worse. One of them was from an MP who had previously been a Liz Truss backer. There is open talk now among MPs about replacing her. The only, that appears to be the majority view. The only thing they can't really agree on is the how and the who. What's, how, how do they actually get rid of her? Who do they replace her with? And that, not being able to get an agreement on that seems to be what is keeping her political career alive right now, albeit on life support. OK, and somehow you've got an exclusive poll. Yeah, so pollsters over at Find Out Now have been busy since that press conference. So these numbers are since Liz Truss got up and sat quasi Kwasang and uh, rode back on, uh, on tax cuts. They, and Find Out Now asked 2,000 representative voters, should Liz Truss now resign? 64% said yes, just 12% said no. Here's the scary thing for them though, 53 of those people, 53% of people who voted Tory in 2019 th thinks that she should go. Then we ask, well, what should happen next? Just 8% back Liz Truss to stay as leader. 61% of people said there should be a general election, including a third of Tory voters. Dress them numbers up any way you want. Still looks pretty ugly for everyone in that house right now. And just to reiterate, th those are this afternoon, after the press conference, after Jeremy Hunt. In complete reaction to what we saw today. Paul, thank you very much. Well, earlier I spoke to the Conservative MP Steve Bryan, who was one of the early backers of Jeremy Hunt in the leadership election this summer. You always wanted Jeremy Hunt to be Prime Minister. Is he now effectively Prime Minister? I think you could look at this as Liz Truss as the chairman and Jeremy Hunt as the chief executive. I mean, look, it hasn't been a good day uh, again, uh, but it's actually ended quite well. I mean, I worked very closely with Jeremy at one of the toughest jobs in government when he was health secretary. I've seen him up close it, under intense pressure and I've seen how he responds and he, he is calm personified. He speaks very carefully and he's somebody who thinks very carefully before he speaks. And I'm rather a fan of that. So this is about character. And I think the Prime Minister has made a very good appointment today. I mean, if, if he is really the chief executive, he's in charge. I mean, it, it's not tenable, is it, for Liz Truss to remain Prime Minister? Look, she has appointed him, and presumably they have had what I would imagine, and I haven't spoken to Jeremy today, but I would imagine they've had a pretty robust conversation. He hasn't just said, yes, Prime Minister, when can I move my stuff in next door? I'd imagine that they've had a pretty direct conversation about the way it's going to be, and Jeremy will have been very clear about uh, on which terms he accepts the job. So, you know, I think this is a new partnership. It's a different approach at the top of government. And, you know, it's people who've been saying, you know, this is a government that's veered off to the right uncontrollably. Uh, actually, this appointment suggests not. I would suggest that this appointment says that the One Nation part of the Conservative Party is right back there, in the number two position in government, and he's right next door. But, it, but it's chaos, isn't it? I mean, you know, you, you, you must see that. A lot of your colleagues are saying that they're going to call on her to go next week. I mean, how long realistically can this go on? I mean, do you have, do you, do you, do you have confidence in her? 
Or do you only have so confidence look, in nothing... her as long as Jeremy Hunt is her chancellor? Look, Christian, there is nothing about four chancellors in as many months that is that is good news. Um, what we need is confidence back into the markets. We need confidence in the policy. So I was pleased to see the U-turn again today on the corporation tax. It was the right thing to do. And there's confidence in the person. Now, I don't know why Kwasi left the job, but I suspect that there was a, a confidence problem uh, with the bank, with the OBR, maybe even the IMF. Jeremy is a very experienced parliamentarian. He's but well you known. Have confidence on the world in this stage. trust. I have confidence in this government, actually, that, and I have confidence that Jeremy, as Chancellor, will re-establish credibility, financial credibility. But that's just the first port of call. It's going to be a very busy weekend this weekend in the Treasury. Jeremy goes through every single line ahead of the 31st. And I you know I make no bones about it. This really just buys time until the 31st of October. Everything still rests on that. And Jeremy will be wanting to make sure that he's got that right. And the Prime Minister needs him to get that right. The markets are not convinced yet. Uh, bond yields went up, the pound went down. That was even after they knew Jeremy Hunt was the new Chancellor. If this mm. goes south next week, it's all over, isn't it? The only option, surely, is a general election. This will be very, very difficult if things go south next week. But I think, actually, things will now hold and things will calm a little until the 31st, till the, till the financial announcement on Halloween. Um, but, you know... Things are moving very fast right now in politics. But I do think the appointment today is sensible. She's put a real grown-up in the room. And Jeremy will do a very, very competent job. And at the end of the day, you know, colleagues who are saying, you know, oh, it's all over, we need a general election, um, you know, it's like football fans and their manager. Once the team starts winning, they come behind the manager. And, you know, if Jeremy produces sensible chancellorship over the next few weeks and a sensible statement on the 31st, then I think you will see people come behind this Downing Street. Um, are you getting ready and would you advise your colleagues to get ready for a general election imminently? There is no need for a general election. We have a parliamentary democracy. We have a majority of 70 or so in the House of Commons. Uh, I think the last thing that the markets really need right now is more instability. I understand why if you are the opposition parties, you want a general election. But, I mean, I don't think that's what the country needs right now. Steve Bryan, thank you very much. So how have the financial markets reacted to the quasi Kwarteng sacking and the Prime Minister's announcement on reinstating the increase in corporation tax? Our economics reporter, Neil MacDonald, is here. Was it enough? Well, based on the judgment of financial markets, no, so far. Um, and that's based on what's been happening to the interest rate on government borrowing, uh, which rose sharply after the Prime Minister's statement. Um, investors have all along been concerned that these tax cuts are based on more borrowing and are not going to be covered by faster growth, as the government would have it. The largest tax cut has gone, but the majority remain. So let me just show you the new numbers that uh, the new Chancellor has to grapple with. There were £43 billion of tax cuts. The change in corporation tax accounted for £18 billion of that. The change in national insurance, 15 billion, and then there's another 10 billion of smaller changes like the change in stamp duty. Now, if they're thinking that they need to unpick some of those other changes, that could all get very complicated. Take national insurance, for example. Um, it went up in April because of Rishi Sunak. They were planning to cut it in November. Could they now say, oh, we're going to put it back up in, what, next April? I mean, that seems incredible, even by current standards. Are they not even giving her any credit for saying public spending will be reduced? I think investors have all along been sceptical about the whole package because they think it puts government borrowing on a pathway that is just unsustainable. And I'll show you the sort of chart that alarms some investors. So the Institute for Fiscal Studies thinks that if you take all government borrowing, our national debt, as a, look at it as a share of our national income, it goes up and up and up for the next five years. It just keeps going up. And they think that if you want to start to bring that number down in five years' time, you need to find £62 billion of savings. So scrapping the entire mini-budget does not fill the hole. And that's, I think, why the Prime Minister was starting to talk about rowing back on some of the public spending plans they have. But, of course, remember, public spending is being squeezed right now by higher inflation. So it's not as if there's loads of easy savings for Mr Hunt to find there. Right, it looks like chaos. It feels like chaos. How serious is this? 
This is a very serious situation. I think over the last couple of weeks there has been a shift in sentiment in the city about the fundamental credibility of the government. Um, and a lot of city economists are saying that what's happened today does not shift that sentiment back. In her press conference, the Prime Minister was still saying that her mission is cutting taxes and faster growth. It seems clear that a lot of investors just do not buy into that strategy and they do not want to fund it. Neil McDonald. Well, earlier I spoke to Paul Johnson, the director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which researches tax and public policy, and I began by asking him where today's U-turn on corporation tax leaves the government's mini-budget and if there is still a credibility gap. Half the tax cuts announced a few weeks ago are still in place, so we're still fiscally in a worse position than we were before the mini-budget. But we're in a worse position even than that, because I think in terms of credibility, we just don't know what the government's economic or fiscal strategy is. We don't know what the forecasts from the OBR are, and we don't know what kind of uh, targets the new Chancellor has. So until we get to the 31st of October, at the earliest, we're really going to still have a huge credibility gap in terms of this government's economic policy. Her other big admission was that what she said on Wednesday about there being no plans for spending reductions has changed. She's now saying that spending... Well, she had a confusing phrase that spending would rise um, by less um, than it was before. What, what did that mean? Well, the planned increases in spending are minuscule at best. Um, what was proposed a year ago now looks very much less generous than intended because, of course, inflation is eating away at it. Uh, increasing less quickly than not very much at all, you get pretty close to spending cuts very quickly. So I think that mu there's, there's at least a chance, a significant chance, actually, that what we'll hear on the 31st of October is that in order to uh, get to some sort of fiscal balance, we will have some uh, spending cuts uh, pencilled in there. I mean, politically, you see politicians and journalists have been around for a long, long time, all scratching their heads at the way things are developing. Have you ever known policy be made like this before? It's pretty hard to think of a moment when we've had so many big changes in direction and new turns. And I think it reflects the fact that the mini-budget was put together at huge speed. Uh, the big decisions appear to have been taken before uh, proper conversations with Treasury officials. It's unravelled very quickly, in part, because this has happened at such a volatile, difficult, febrile time. In any case, they couldn't have tried this set of policies at a worse moment. But the, the Bank of England's bond-buying facility ended today, as far as we know, um, and yet gilt yields are still going up, the price of gilts is going down. I mean, th this does not look like the problem has been solved by the end of business today. I mean, could it all go mad next week? We certainly haven't solved the problem. The problem of um, the fiscal gap remains. The problem of high yields on government debt remains. Uh, the problem that we just don't know what the markets are going to do over the next week or two because of uh, the political and economic uncertainty remains. And that's going to stay in place, I think, at least until we've got a clear statement of the economic forecast from the OBR and a clear statement of fiscal and economic policy from the government. And we're still a long distance from that. So changing the personnel doesn't tell you enough? In a sense, changing the personnel makes things even less clear. At least we knew what Kwasi Kwarteng stood for alongside Liz Truss. But what Liz Truss and Jeremy Hunt together are going to come up with in terms of an economic policy, I just think we don't know. Kwasi Kwarteng, one of the first things he did was junk the rules which Rishi Sunak legislated at the beginning of this year. Well, they've been junked and nothing's been put in their place. We need to see what's being put in their place. Paul Johnson, thank you very much.